everybody. Welcome to Josie. Um, is there any of you, are there any of you out there who are in love at the moment? Yeah. No, exactly, none of you. Proves my point. <laughs> you know, I don't believe in love at first sight. Um, I don't think it's very easy finding love. I've also found that... God, you're a handsome bloke, aren't you? <laughs> oh, there, camera three. And the end. Oh, isn't he beautiful, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Oh, where was I? Oh, yes, yeah. I've, I've always found that, uh, that love is something that should sort of mushroom slowly. You know, I've never been a great believer in sort of fancying somebody as soon as I clap my eyes on them. <laughs> Although I must say that this bloke is really something. <laughs> You're straight out of the room, Mark Gorgeous, aren't you? <laughs> Let's get a closer look. Oh, God, yes. Look at those eyebrows. Like two elegant strokes in a painting by Matisse. <laughs> What's your name? Ian. 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 Yeah. Ian. That was my mother's name. <laughs> Has anybody ever told you you're an exceptionally handsome man, Ian? Not particularly, no. Oh, then they're fools. Let's have a look at your profile. Oh, look at that. Each curve imperceivably short of perfection. <laughs> Is that your girlfriend? Hello. <laughs> Listen, uh, Ian, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to get off with you somehow. Huh? I'll think of something as the show goes on, so enjoy yourself. Everybody have a nice show, OK? See you later, Ian. Bye. <laughs> My name, as you probably all know, is Erica Perfect, and I will be giving this evening's class in the series Great Mistresses of the Theatre. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to my four <laughs> victims. They are, from left to right, Susan Harris, who was widely acclaimed for her recent brilliant portrayal of Rosalind in As You Like It, apparently. Then <laughs> Stuart Hearn and Louise Ambrose, who you wouldn't have seen in anything unless you're under five or in prison. And <laughs> last, but by no means least, the tall, dark, handsome John Rhodes, whom I predict will go very far in this difficult old business of ours. <laughs> right, to work. <laughs> The first excerpt I have chosen is the famous interview scene in the play, The Importance of Being Earnest, or as we professionals know it, importance, or indeed, earnest. <laughs> now, <laughs> Susan and John, would you read, please? And now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a mistake. I'm sorry. Can I interrupt? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> June, to lose both looks like carelessness. Yes, but remember, this is high comedy. That is, well, it's comedy, but it's not actually very funny. Come on. <laughs> Who was your father? I'm afraid I don't really know. Well, the fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... well, I was found. Found? Comedy of manners, remember? Manners! If you spit like that, you must say, I beg your pardon, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the late Mr Thomas Cardew found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Now, Susan, if I were playing your part, and it is much older than my playing range, I would use this um, rather boring speech of his to um, walk around, stroke the furniture. Remember, it will be antique. It's a period play. Look at the photographs on the mantelpiece. You see? It's what you make it. Go on. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I've got to stop you there. A handbag? <laughs> why, oh, why do you stress this word so? Well, Edith Evans did it like that. Who? 
Edith Evans. <laughs> she was famous as Lady Bracknell. She was a dame. <gasps> Well, there you are, then. I'm pleased to say that I have never had to resort to appearing in pantomime. What way to speak is that? It's got to be believable, love. Let's try a little exercise, shall we, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, Susan, this is the leather counter at Derry and Tom's, and you're coming to me to purchase a handbag, OK? <clears throat> Could I help you, madam? Yes, I'd like a handbag. A what? A handbag. There you are, you see? A handbag. You didn't say, a handbag. <laughs> In fact, nothing would tempt you to say, a handbag, unless you take an inebriate or something. Fine if you want to be actressy and showy, lovey, but we're in the business of truth. Would you mind if we continue with this exercise? I find it very useful. Hmm. Right, so I'll try and sell you a handbag. What would you like, madam? I'd like a handbag, please. <laughs> How much is that? Five thousand pounds, madam. How much? Five thousand pounds. For a handbag? <laughs> there you are, then. Context. Well, I'm sorry, lovey, but if you don't want to learn anything, maybe you shouldn't be here. This class is for people who want to learn something from an old hand. Oh, has been, you mean? <gasps> <laughs> don't forget your handbag! <laughs> oh, how she managed to slip through the net. On to our next piece, I think. <laughs> the Bard. William Shakespeare. We've got a lovely scene from Richard III. Now, um, Louise, I'd like you to read Lady Anne, and John Richard. <laughs> <laughs> this is the scene where Richard, who is not yet the third but just a duke, tries to woo Lady Anne, who is attending her husband's funeral. Lady Anne, of course, was the famous Anne Boleyn who walked the bloody tower. What? <laughs> Oh, no, silly me. <laughs> I always get those two confused. Uh, divorced, beheaded, deceased. Um, Anne of Cleves, the Flanders mayor. I don't think she was, actually, historically. Look, it doesn't matter if you're Anne Summers. Just say the words. <laughs> Being intellectual about this isn't going to get you anywhere. Everyone knows that Shakespeare always got his history all wrong. Now, where are we? Let's have a look. Yes, you see? Widow of Edward, son of Henry, later Gloucester's wife. You see? Satisfied? I'm bored with that. Let's move on, shall we? When can I have a go? Excuse me? When can I have a go? I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't quite understand. Everyone knows that Jack Worthing and Richard III were not fat. They're just not fat rules. I tell you the part you should be angling for, lovey. Hamlet. It's an old theory of mine. So far, no one's had the money to put it on, but there are lines. Oh that this too, too solid flesh would melt. <laughs> Hamlet's fatness explains why he can't get up and react as he'd like to. It's because he's obese, like you. <laughs> you want to have a turn. Well, you can't. That's hardly fair. Fair? Who said anything about it being fair? If there was any fairness in this business, it'd be me up there at the National playing all the main parts instead of Nergy Smith and Janet Sussman and all those other third raters. Fair? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. There's only one way to get on in this business nowadays. Change your name to Judy Dench. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> oh, yes. The third piece is from what we professionals call the Scottish play. This old theatrical superstition says that if you mention the word Macbeth, something always goes wrong. But I don't believe... <laughs> Hello? Oh, oh dear, we, we uh, appear to have blown a fuse. Um, uh, well, tell you what, in the meantime, I'll give you a few hints on radio acting. <laughs> oh, good. There we are. Now, well... Hello? Hello? Camera one? Again. Do you like my new shoes? 
They didn't have them in my size, but I just had to have them. <laughs> Actually, these shoes are just an excuse so I can come out and have a look at you again, Ian. <laughs> Ian, your glowing beauty is a beacon of light amongst the black brooding ugliness of the rest of the audience. <laughs> Sh shove over a bit. Shove over. What's your girlfriend's name? Francis. Francis. <laughs> we'll watch this next bit together, just you and me, eh, Ian? <laughs> Little tinker. <laughs> All right, then. I hope you like me in it. <laughs> Now. Oh, shut up, Tommy. You're just after finishing your milky slack. Well, let us have our rickets fair, won't it? Reckon have a good chance of winning competition. <laughs> Been working on these 60 years. Happen he might give us day off, Alfred. Then again, happen he might not. Old Hardwick, Alice respected tradition. Even had a slice of roast pit pony along with the rest of us. <laughs> well, this new toff, this Granville, his heart's as hard as last week's palm cake. <laughs> Hang it, Father. Can't you let them have the day off for their rickets fair? They do so look forward to it. It breaks a chap's heart to see them glum. Stuff and nonsense, Thomas. What care I that for the past 300 years these lazy scoundrels have devoted this day to their ridiculous deformity? <laughs> Why, have they never heard of progress? Sir, I've finished sweeping the chimney with me hair. Well, that's for your trouble, lad. <laughs> but, Father, the previous owner always allowed. The previous owner be damned. There's an order to fill. 300 tons of grime to be delivered by Tuesday. <laughs> Only this rabble and all of their machines at the stroke of six. I'll sack every man jack of them. It just seems so beastly. The Nash, Thomas. That's what these people understand. <laughs> Why, don't tell me that you've had some intercourse with them. <laughs> no. No. Well, you'd better be off. Your train to Macclesfield leaves in a quarter of an hour. And I trust that managing our man-trap factory there will teach you a little bit about life. <laughs> Farewell. Farewell, Father. <laughs> Mr. Granville, sir, I've been locked in this drawer for six weeks now. Well, have you finished yet? Don't rightly know, sir. You don't rightly know? <laughs> don't get back in there till you do rightly know. <laughs> to start trying throwing or not. Oh. Dying for a boiled cobble. Oh. <laughs> well, you think you took a swig, Mr Granville, oh, then? Oh, now then, now then. Didn't I sort it out when the school roof fell in and all the little children caught pleurisy? Ah. <laughs> Didn't I sort it out when the mine shaft exploded and 300 picking areas were trapped? You did. Oh. <laughs> was levelled by earthquake and there weren't a pound of butter to be had for love nor money. Oh. <laughs> I'll have a bit of faith then, Chuck. Hey, oh. on, hey Mum, is it dinner time yet? Sure up. <laughs> What? E, if only Thomas were here to help me. Thomas.
shut up, you great lump of suet. Get on with it before we all die of tuberculosis. Four minutes to the hour. These northern ne'er-do-wells had better make up their minds. It's either shovel that grime or pack your bags. <laughs> How do, Mr Granville? I've come to have a word. What is the meaning of this intrusion? I, sir, am an important visitor. Well, I'm expecting no one. Neither am I. Shall we have a chat in the meantime? <laughs> Who? Madam, are you? I, sir, am the Duchess of Rochdale. <laughs> Duchess of Rochdale? Well, as Lady Mayor of Rochdale Town Council, you are our most valued customer. And since I bought the factory so recently, I don't believe we've had the chance to meet. <laughs> How do you do? Ah, very well, generally, but not so good on a Monday morning. <laughs> if I may say so, you don't sound very much like a duchess. And you don't sound very much like a classy old so-and-so. But I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Now, what's this about you not letting your workers have their rickets fair? But it's sheer nonsense. There's no business indulging in levity when there's an important order of grime due on Tuesday. <laughs> to your council, I believe. Yes, uh, but that's the point, you see. Uh, we won't be needing it on Tuesday now, so you can let these people have their day off after all. But, but, but this is madness. I can't <laughs> believe that you approve of such a base gathering as the Ricketts Fair. Ah, uh, well, that's where you're wrong, see. <laughs> to have my tier three upon a silver trolley with buttered scones and petty fours i thought myself quite jolly but then one day i chanced to glance down at the ducal feet and what a shock my legs were bored as wide as oxford street <laughs> i can't tell you what rickets has done for me the men of me toes has bought an ending to be wars, and now I guess the strange contortions that afflict me lower portions cause the rickets will be changing me. <laughs> For where before I died on veal and salmon from the river, I now prefer a plate of tripe with lard and bullock's liver. <laughs> it's fine you'll see it a little life refined and quite well bred. But better far to have a pair of bandy legs instead. <laughs> I can't tell you what Ricketts has done for me. The bending on me toes has brought an end to me woes. And now I bless the strange contortions that deflict me lower portions. Cause the Ricketts won't be changed. Most irregular. But I suppose if you don't require the grime until a later date, I might as well let my workers have their little celebration. You will? Hooray! <laughs> Does that mean I can come down there, Mr. Granville? Oh, I suppose so. Thank you, sir. Well, Thomas, what are you doing here? Father, I cannot go to Macclesfield. I have something terribly important to tell you. Good day to you all. I am the Duchess of Rochdale. <laughs> the Duchess of... That is correct. And I've come to request that the order of grime be delivered on Monday rather than Tuesday. I reckon it can probably wait, Thomas. <laughs> can you add your say? What did he say? Well, lads and lasses, I've got news for you. He's got news? news? Yes. You've all been sacked. <laughs> well, you know what that means, don't you? It means no money and slow starvation and epidemics of cholera. <laughs> well, yes. But it also means we can have our rickets fair after all, can't we? Yeah. Yeah. Though the economic slumps have put us in the dumps, that doesn't mean that we should all despair. It doesn't follow that you have to care When you can laugh at me And chuckle at your sorrows The happy fellow borrows from the bluebird song If you're 
Thomas, it's disgusting. It's unnatural. No, Father. We are the freaks of nature with our fine clothes and our money. I want to be like them. I want to say E and now them. <laughs> I want to put coal in t t bath. <laughs> And there's sure to be a lawsuit to employ us. And you can laugh, hee hee, and chuckle at your sorrows. The happy fellow borrows from the bluebird song. If you're home, the happy tune, you'll find it very soon. You can chuckle at your sorrows all along. You can chuckle at your sorrows all along. What is it, love? Any chance of some donkey pie, eh, Josie? Did you enjoy that, Ian? Yeah, it was great. Cool. Come, come here. Let me show you the set more closely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful set, isn't it? Very surreal. Yeah. I like red. <laughs> now this is Richard. Hello, Ian. Stand there, love. Now you don't have to be jealous of Richard because we're just good friends, aren't we, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> now it's the time where we have to say goodbye to the lovely people. The end of the show. I'm going to sing a little love song to you, Ian. <laughs> Old object, please, just to go with Ian. <laughs> what? A bed. No, not a bed. That's a bit too obvious for us, isn't it? Ian? A microwave. <laughs> Ian, I'm not being sloppy. Ian, I'm not being sickly. But just like a microwave, Ian, you hot me up quickly. <laughs> microwave and turn your dial you'll find that I'm still cooking and I'll come out with a smile <laughs> oh Ian I love you with every inch of my being yes I love being in a microwave with you so come on let's heat things up Ian 